Good morning, church. It is the third week of Advent, and so here we are this morning to get going, talking about the gospel this morning. Of course, Advent is the first season in the uh, historic Christian calendar, and the historic Christian calendar is a discipline that walks through the life of Jesus every year, leads the church through his life. We walk it with him, and this part represents that long period of time leading up to the birth of Jesus, um, between the promises of the prophets and the poets and Moses and the law, and the fulfillment of those promises in Jesus. So it's about anticipation and longing and waiting for the faithfulness of God. And our text this morning is one of my favorite in, um, favorites in all of the Bible. It is from Luke chapter 1. We're actually up to the Gospels now as we go through this four-week progression of Advent, and this is Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. This is as she's going to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who of course is expecting uh, a child who will be John the Baptist. And so this is the song that she sings as she comes into uh, this visit with Elizabeth. Starting in Luke chapter 1 in verse 46. Mary said, with all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God, my Savior. He has looked with favor on those of low status or on the low status, status of his servant, rather. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. And he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. So there's so much we could say about this song. Uh, like I said, it's one of my favorite texts in all of the Bible. And uh, we could talk about this morning things like how uh, Mary's song, Mary's Magnificat is what it has historically been called, uh, follows in uh, a, a, a line of great songs and poetry of praise in moments like these. I think back to how um, Mary borrowed from, for instance, Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2 where God delivered Hannah from her uh, plight by giving her a child, as she asked. That, of course, was Samuel, which she then dedicated to the Lord. I think back to um, Exodus chapter 15, and Luke is very much telling, as Matthew and Mark are as well, very much telling an Exodus story and how when the children of Israel came to the far side of the Red Sea, what they did is they broke out in praise, recounting the, the glory of the acts of God. This is what God has done. This is who God is. This is God has showed up in our life. Let us tell you the ways that God has done this. We could talk about that, and as a matter of fact, in a few minutes, we'll have a little more to say about that. Or looking at the Magnificat, we could talk about the actual character of God and how that plays out, how he is exalting Mary in particular. And Mary here is a single pregnant teenager from a nowhere town, a woman in a culture that doesn't value women as highly as God values women anyway. And it is through Mary that God is choosing to do great things. It is through Mary against all possibilities that God is choosing to do great things. And this teaches us something about the way God works. And it even weaves itself into the song. As Mary sings about God pulling the mighty down from their thrones and lifting up the lowly, sending the full away empty-handed and filling up the hungry, that sort of reversal the pulling down those who have traditionally been on top of the pile, stepping on those on the bottom of the pile, and the standing up of those on the bottom of the pile. That is something that will run right through not only Luke's gospel, but the entire Bible. This says something about who God is, and we could talk at great length about that, including the fact that part of that lowering of the proud, that bringing down of the mighty, is the offer for them to come to their senses. For them to realize that the life they have been leading leads to nothing but death for not only their neighbors, but also them. And to repent of that, that bringing down was always first and foremost in Jesus' life, 
a call to repentance before it was a threat of judgment. And it's a call to repentance that perhaps we should listen to as those who live on top of the pile perpetually in our lifetime. As Americans, we've always been on top of the pile. So perhaps Mary has a word for us, an offer for repentance for us. But what I want to talk about mostly this morning for the few minutes that we have left, uh, we could talk about those things, but I want to talk about um, how the Magnificat fits into this progression that we've been noticing. There's a progression to Advent. We began in the first week with Job 17, and we talked about the present darkness in the world and how sometimes it's okay to just acknowledge the present darkness, to sit with people in the present darkness, that sometimes things just aren't right, things just aren't good. Sometimes we just don't have good choices before us. And we need that lesson in times like 2020, where it seems like no matter what we do, even the best of what we do, uh, takes us places that we just simply don't want to go. And so sometimes it's okay to just in lament, and despair, say things are bad. But the second week we notice that out of this darkness, out of the brokenness, out of our lament, it ought to, as we sit with it, call us to cry out to God. We looked at Isaiah 64, and Isaiah 64 is that great text that begins with a prophet asking God, pleading with God to come down from the heavens to rip the skies apart and to set things right, to show himself to be God. And so this cry comes out of the darkness, and ultimately God is as we will see today, revealed to be the one who hears that cry in the darkness, who answers that cry, who brings redemption and liberation. But we are not the people who sit in the darkness and just are consigned to it. We are not the ones who just settle for the way things are. We are not the ones who just say unhelpfully, well, that's the way the world works. We are the ones who cry out in the darkness, who insist that there must be something more than the brokenness, who insist that life is meant for more than this death-dealing world that we have made. And from the darkness and the despair that comes with that to the crying comes this week, we, we come to hope. Because Mary is in the middle of that darkness. She is in the very middle of the situation that we talked about for both of the first two weeks, how everything that the Jews held important either had fallen away or they become some weird kind of backwards farce of what they were meant to be. Nothing was working quite right. Nothing was exactly the way it should be. Some of the pieces were in place, but even then they didn't fit well. So Mary lived in the midst of this darkness, and in the midst of the darkness, she finds hope. And Mary's not the first one to do that in the Gospel of Luke. Luke has already been setting the stage, even though this is only halfway through chapter 1. If you go back to the first verses of the chapter, this is a theme that Luke is already developing. We begin the Gospel of Luke with Zechariah at the temple. Zechariah is a countryside priest in the realm of Judah, in the, the land of Judah. His wife is Elizabeth. It says that they are righteous people that they um, are getting on in their years, but they don't, don't have children. He points that out. And Zechariah has gone to the temple to serve his uh, yearly rotation, and he has been selected at the time of prayer to go into the temple and to light the altar of incense. Now, a little background there. In Jerusalem at the temple, there were regular daily periods of prayer, the morning and the evening and uh, when those prayer times came along, one of the priests on duty would be selected by lot or, or some other fashion to go into the um, holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place, the place that only the priests were allowed to go, and to light the altar of incense so this sweet-smelling incense would rise before God as the people lifted their prayers. And as Zechariah does this in Luke chapter 1, there is, um, there is this crowd of people gathered around at the temple. And in these early chapters of Luke, this crowd of people, just the people he calls them, they represent the faithful people of God, the ones who are anticipating the coming of God. And the truth of the matter is that through the centuries of darkness, through the Babylonian persecution and the Assyrian or the Assyrian persecution, the Babylonian persecution, the Persians, and then the Greeks and the Syrians and the Egyptians again, and then the Romans, uh, the people of God had developed these these routines of anticipation 
where they cried out and they longed for and they asked God to come and faithfully keep his promises. And one of the things that they would do if they were in the temple area is they would gather for prayer at these times of prayer, the lighting of the incense in the morning and the evening. They built their life around it. And so they would get up in the morning, they would go to the temple, and they would offer their prayers to God. Will you keep your promises? Will you make good on what you said you would do? Lord, we are waiting for you. And then they would go about their business, and then evening would come, and they would stop what they were doing, and they would go to the temple, and they would lift up their prayers. Lord, will you keep your promises? Will you be faithful to what you said you would do? Uh, said you would do? Lord, we are waiting on you. And the beginning of Luke's gospel starts at one of these times where the people gather to faithfully anticipate, to cry out for, to long for the coming of God's promises. They're looking for God to act. And they got that wrong in a lot of ways. They misunderstood how God would act, but in many ways they got it right as well. They were waiting for the right thing, even if they misunderstood what that thing would be. And the story goes on from there. Uh, Zechariah meets an angel in the holy place. The angel gives him a message that he will have a child, that this child will be John, that John will be the forerunner of the Messiah as prophesied with Isaiah and the other prophets. He goes back out to the countryside, unable to speak because of that story that goes down there. And then the scene switches to Mary. This pregnant, or not yet pregnant, this single teenage girl from a nowhere town in the middle of nowheresville on the corner of the Roman Empire and the angel says to her that she is to be the mother of the Messiah and she responds um, she responds understandably enough I'm not married and obviously you don't understand how this works and the angel kind of explains to her how things will go and Mary Luke sets her up at the end of this story as the faithful Israelite. You have the faithful people anticipating the coming of God, but Mary is kind of set up as the ideal Israelite in this time of anticipation. She learns that in the most unexpected of ways, in the most unusual of ways, in ways that would cost her personally, that God is now acting. And this thing that her people have been praying for, have been longing for, have been expecting for hundreds of years, she looks the angel in the eye and says, may it be as you said, let it be so. I'm in with this. I'm down with it. And so this is the context as so we head into this song that Mary sings. And one of the interesting things about this song that Mary sings, this song of praise that she brings to God, is that she's just found out that she is going to be carrying the Messiah. She just found out that she's going to be a mother. She's only just found out that she is expecting a child. The child has not come. The child has not grown. The child has not started his ministry. The child has not started turning the world on its head. The child has not gone to the cross. The child has not been resurrected. The child is not seated at the right hand of God, ruling over the entire cosmos. But yet, in her song, she's already speaking in the present tense. All of the things that she actually declares that God has done is talking, not the present tense, but the past tense. Lord, you have drawn the powerful down from their thrones. Lord, you have lifted up those of low estate. Lord, you have sent away those who are full. Lord, you have filled up those who are empty. Lord, you have done great things. And so as we look at Mary's song, I want to go back for just a second and consider that um, that impulse of the people of God throughout the Bible to when they come to a great moment, they bring praise to God. And here Mary stands at the beginning of the story. You know, Hannah, she, she sings praise to God after Samuel is born. And the Egyptians or the Israelites fleeing the Egyptians, rather, they, they sing praise to God after they come to the far side of the Red Sea. Mary stands in the midst of the darkness and sings praise to God with such confidence that it seems like what God will do has already been done. 
This is that proleptic nature, if I can use that word again, that we've been talking about, that the Bible brings with it. Proleptic is living in the present as if the future is already true. We want to be new heaven, new earth people in the present, even though God is still bringing about new heavens and new earth. Mary sings in the present as if what God will do in the future has already been done. Mary sings not only a song of praise, not only a song declaring what God has done in the past, because everything that she sings about in her song could be a song about what God has done in the past, but she imbibes it, she endues it with a new purpose. This is talking about what God will do in the future. It becomes a song of hope. And so out of that darkness, there comes despair. And out of the despair, there comes this cry. And as we lean into the nature of God, as we develop these uh, rhythms of longing and anticipation that Advent asks us to develop, we then become the people who have a voice of hope. That there should be more to this world. But, and there is more to this world, that things ought not be like this. And there are other ways possible. And what's more, we are the ones who cry out that God is the one who is bringing about those other ways. And so we come back to that thing that we've said so often that you can probably quote it with me. In the church, sometimes we have this temptation to believe that our message is to tell the world that it's falling apart, that it's broken, that it's going to hell. That is not our message. Anybody can tell the truth of that. If you live long enough, you are going to see the brokenness of the world face to face. The message of the church is not that everything is bad, but that given the darkness of our world, God loves it enough to address it that he's redeeming, that he's restoring, that he's reconciling. And at the heart of, at the, the, the place where that darkness and that reconciling power meet, we have people like Mary in the darkness singing songs of hope, singing praise of what God will do, saying the more is coming, the sun will rise, the banquet will come into its fullness, the new day is dawning. And church, with our worship, with our lives and our actions and our words and the way that we are in the world as individuals and communities, this is our task. We are a people of hope. And that hope is not wishful thinking as I hope to get a convertible one day. As much as I would want for that to happen, I don't think it's ever really going to happen. No, biblical hope is a certainty that something will happen in the future. It's coming. It just hasn't happened yet. And whereas all of the other things that we place our hope in will let us down, we are the ones who stand in the darkness, giving witness to the light that is breaking on the horizon, saying that light will not let us down. And so we sing praises of hope. And that is, in the Advent tradition, learning to live in the darkness just as important as learning to cry out. Both of those things are always there. They're never mutually exclusive. We are the ones who cry out in the darkness, and we are the ones who declare hope in the darkness. And so I'm going to stop there. We're almost out of time. Next week, we're going to actually come to the birth of Jesus it's going to be that uh, end of Advent, as it were. They call it Christmas tide, the turning of the tide between the darkness and the coming of the light. And we're going to celebrate that. But this week, go be people of hope. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then I'm about out of time. So we're going to quit it there. You recite the verses that remind us who we are as families on your own. Lord, we pray that you would be with us. We pray that you would give us eyes and ears and hearts that can see the hope that you are bringing into the world and that we would declare that with all we are. And we come now and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. We hope to see you soon. But in the meantime, stay safe and do good. Have a great week.